Hey guys, it's Paul Myers, co-owner and lead therapist of Intentional Counseling. We are a group counseling practice in Frisco, Texas, and we specialize in mental health. And today I'm going to cover a counseling theory uh, called psychoanalytic counseling theory. You know, one of the first counseling theories ever made was made by Sigmund Freud. This is really good information if you're a counseling student or if you're a counselor in training. Uh, this is actually a request of one of our viewers uh, to do this. And so if you have ideas or things that you want me to cover, feel free to comment below. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and dive in. So let's take a look at this theory. I have it broken down into four sections. Uh, this is an overview of the theory. I could talk about this theory a lot. There's a lot to it. This is just a quick, brief, general overview. So we've got the key focus of the theory, uh, the, uh, what they prioritize. We've got goals that the theory um, in counseling, like what their, what their goals are, the role of the therapist, in, in this, uh, this theory, if the therapist has this theoretical orientation, this is the type of role they're going to play. And we have the development theory behind the role, which um, helps kind of explain the way of thinking. Okay, so let's look at the focus. So psychoanalytic theory really focuses on client history. It focuses on the past a lot. Uh, and more specifically, it focuses on uh, the client's childhood, and so uh, in early childhood experiences, okay? Uh, I will say there are a lot of aspects of psychoanalytic theory that I find odd or not exactly practical or relevant, but there are certain aspects of this theory uh, that I even use in my practice today. So um, this basic client history is very helpful because it helps you gain insight into the client. Then we have the interrelationship of the client's personality. Okay, so anytime you see the word personality when it comes to psychoanalytic theory, don't think personality as you know it today. Um, this is a very, a very different way of looking at personality. Uh, when in psychoanalytic theory, when you say personality, what they're talking to, what they're referring to is the id, the ego, and the superego. And those are the three aspects of personality that uh, play different roles and they're in conflict with each other. And so that's what they're referring to. We'll cover that in detail when we get down here, but um, just keep that in mind. When you see personality, don't think, oh, like Myers-Briggs or Enneagram or anything like that. Think like uh, psychoanalytic theory has its own way of looking at personality entirely that is very different, okay? So that's a big component to this theory is, you know, focusing on that and how these aspects of their personality are at conflict with each other. And then we have the counselor-client relationship. So uh, this is important in any therapy that you do, but there's a, there's a, there's a, a unique dynamic with the counselor and the client and this type of Counseling theory, uh, the the counselor is really um, using. There's a lot of safety needed to do this. Like the client really needs to feel super comfortable uh, with that counselor to be able to do this theory, just because it's uh, the the theory itself is very vulnerable, very odd, very triggering for a lot of people. Uh, there's an element of, of psychological risk and danger to doing this counseling theory and not applicable for a lot of clients, but that is a big aspect to it. Another focus of this theory is catharsis. So um, Freud termed like catharsis or every action, which is like the purging of emotions or getting, getting rid of all those inner emotions. That's something I really support and value. I think there's a lot of value to that. I still use it in my practice today, uh, cathartic release, or the, you know, getting those inner emotions out, I find very helpful for people They feel lighter uh, physically and mentally after they do this. Um, another focus is transference and counter-transference. Again, super relevant in any therapy, uh, really helpful for the counselor to be aware of mostly to manage that. So transference and counter-transference is when the client brings their personal experiences 
into the therapy and they're kind of uh, transferring that those feelings of like things that have actually happened in their life onto the therapist. And so there's a kind of blurring of the line between um, you know their reality and the therapist, and that that's kind of merging. Okay, and so you can see there's some element of danger, and it's not good, right? Countertransference is the other way around, where the counselor, this is worse, so the counselor is taking their personal stuff and merging that and then putting it onto the client, and it's like the client's triggering their stuff, and then, you know, which transference is the, the client's stuff is triggered and brought in and put onto the therapist, and so there's that merging, you know, at the end of the day, you know, like, Therapists are people, so you know you, you can get this. There's this element of risk in therapy. A, a good therapist is going to be aware of those and uh, making sure that that's not interfering with the, the therapy at all so it can continue to be productive. But those are good terms. Very useful, very relevant, even today. Okay, so then we got goals of the, of the theory. So uh, intellectual awareness is a huge goal. That we want to gain insight. There's a lot of analyzing, a lot of thinking, a lot of intellectualizing in this theory. Uh, so intellectual awareness is a great goal that, that they have for the client. Restructuring the personality. There we see it again. Personality. That's referring to id, ego, super ego. Okay. They want to restructure that. Um, there's the a goal of taking the unconscious and bringing it into the conscience. So. Uh, this here is strange because, you know, it assumes that the therapist is uh, fully aware of what's in the client's uh, unconscious, uh, which you don't actually know that, <laughs> but, um, but that's, the, that's what this theory really uh, claims that, okay, we're going to bring the unconscious thoughts into the conscious and you're more aware now, right? Okay, and the last one's resolve repressed conflicts, so uh, when we refer to conflicts, they're, what they're talking about is, again, it, ego, super ego, and how those are at conflict, and that's not resolved, and you have unresolved feelings, and, and that's a, a problem uh, in this theory. Okay? So then we have the counselor role. So this is the therapist's uh, strategy or the, the position they take. Okay? So classic psychoanalytic, traditional psychoanalytic, the therapist would sit behind the client. The client would lay down um, and, uh, you know, be in the room and the therapist would be behind them so the client couldn't even see them. Uh, and the therapist would take notes and then be talking. So it would be mostly auditory for the client. Uh, and then they would be, you know, the idea is they would be like comfortable and like able to think and really trust that therapist a lot. As you can imagine, that would make a lot of people really uncomfortable. And so, uh, but, you know, that's why there's such a focus on the client counselor relationships where they can have that level of comfort. Um, you know, nowadays, a lot of therapies are more normal where you just kind of, uh, you're, you're squaring up and you're having a face to face discussion and it's just more of a normal discussion versus this is the, the client and counselor. Uh, is very unique, where the counselor is this anonymous expert, right? Where they know, and the counselor and the client really trusts that counselor's judgment. Okay, um, the counselor's role is also to interpret the meaning of the client's current behavior and how that links to the client's past. Okay, uh, again, you know, it assumes that the counselor. You know, knows all of this and you know has all of the, the all of the insight and knowledge. Um, I would argue, like you don't actually know that because you you can't read people's minds. Like you don't really know. Everyone's different, so well, you know, the, people define their own meaning and they kind of uh, look at things differently. And usually, the client kind of decides what things mean to them. Uh, versus in this, the therapist tells the client what this what this means. Okay, so uh, a little odd, but that's that's the idea of this. Then we have the uh, uh, the counselor really focuses on countering transference and the resistance that the client uh, brings. So as you can see, it's a very very vulnerable style of therapy, 
And so uh, you could see some people being very resistant to that. So the counselor is supposed to you know, reduce that fears and anxieties of the client, get them comfortable, and, and reduce that transference, which is almost guaranteed in this style of therapy. Um, so, and the reason the transference occurs almost guaranteed is because the style of therapy actually encourages it. Like it, it encourages the client to project their stuff towards the therapist. So it can be a really dangerous exercise doing that, uh, especially with trauma patients and, and things like that. But you, um, the idea of encouraging the client to project their stuff onto the therapist, it's almost like the therapist plays a role and we, they want that client to bring all their stuff all to light so that the therapist gains insight, right? But it's also really triggering for the client. So a little element of danger there, and you know, it's almost guaranteed to have some transference. Uh, so that's why they focus on transference a lot to counter it, okay? And so now we're gonna cover development theory. Uh, Freud had his own theory, he had his own philosophy with this, where he developed what he called psychosexual stages. And uh, I'm not going to go into that. There's a lot of details in there. There's all these stages. You could research that on your own. If you're a counseling student, you're going to have to know this for your exam if you're going to get licensed. But uh, he had his own thoughts on all that. I don't necessarily agree with any of it, but <laughs> you can definitely research it because Freud was really foundational in uh, forging uh, psychology as an industry, right? So that's why it's covered. Um, but Freud's idea was if you go through these stages successfully, you resolve them developmentally, then you develop healthy personality. Remember, personality is id, ego, and superego, and that's the goal is, is getting that all into balance. And so that's his idea. Failure to resolve those stages results in personality flaws versus resolving them results in healthy personality development. Okay. Freud really focused a lot on anxiety. And this theory uh, kind of is like an all roads lead to anxiety kind of theory. And so they say anxiety comes from repressed conflicts in that personality. So you unresolved stuff and you have anxiety. And you know, he also covers defense mechanisms, which are attempts to reduce anxiety, which actually I find really helpful. I still use those in my practice today. I actually did a whole other video on defense mechanisms if you wanted to research that. That's a huge aspect of this theory. Um, but yeah, th that's like coping with that anxiety. We have those defense mechanisms. I find this helpful. But let's cover the id, ego, super ego. So I think this will wrap it all in together. I think it'll make a lot of sense to you. So we've got id being the human nature part of you, the inner drive, the inner instincts for just raw uh, pleasure or thrill or enjoyment or comfort, right? In the, the biblical world, from a biblical perspective, we would call it uh, sin nature or human nature where the desires of the flesh, right? Like our, our bodies, we want comfort, we want enjoyment, we want pleasure, we want what we what, want, what it wants, right? Um, so it's very much a chaotic kind of primal instinct type of the personality, okay? Uh, then we have the ego, which is like the, the realist, you know, we're trying to uh, attach uh, reality to what's going on. It's like that rationale, okay? Very, very realistic. Uh, the ego is kind of like um, a mediator and a balancing act between the id and the superego, which are the opposite of each other. So uh, the ego kind of blends them all in nicely, okay? Uh, then we got the superego, which is the opposite of the ego. It's like higher sense of morality, ideals. Um, it's about the principle, uh, about honor, and um, you know, you know, it, this sense of like values and morals uh, and how that could be perfect or should be perfect. So it's uh, based off uh, principles and rules. Okay, and so um, you can see how principles and rules pretty much are in direct conflict with, well, I want what I want, I want it now, human instinct, okay? So they're at odds with each other. And then the ego is trying to balance those two and bring it into the real world and attach it to reality and be realistic about the whole thing, okay? So as you can see, a lot going on there, a, lot, a very interesting way of looking at that, but, you know, that, that was his view, okay? 
So there we go. So anytime you see those uh, the, those three things, they're kind of at uh, at war. They're at conflict. That's the aspects of the personality. That's really what this theory is referring to. When it comes, it says conflicts. It says personality. Yeah, that's kind of repeated in here. That's that's most of what they're discussing. Okay. All right. There's a lot more to this theory than that, um, but hopefully you found this interesting or helpful. Um, if you have any comments, leave it below. We would appreciate that. Subscribe as well. It helps us grow. And we appreciate you stopping by. Take care.